Our guest this week has worked for the federal government for 13 years, but started her public service career since she was 18. So why does she want to study law now and specialize in immigration law? Our guest will answer that question and share her story with us today. But before I welcome her, I would like to remind everyone to please click on the subscribe button and the bell icon so you don't miss any of our inspiring videos. Hello everyone, this is Margie Bruce here at Global Inspiration, where you need to be seen, you need to be heard, and be an inspiration to the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest this week, JC Gamroth. Hello everybody. Hi JC, how are you? I'm good, how are you doing? Good, thank you. So thank you so much for being here. And I want to start with, um, where were you born and raised? Okay, well, thank you. Uh, first, Margie, thank you for having me, Global Inspirations. Uh, thank you for reaching out. Um, hopefully I'm inspirational, but I don't know. I think I'm pretty average. <laughs> so, um, I was first born in the Philippines. Um, I was born in the island of Leyte and then adopted and then raised in the U.S. You are an adventurer and have traveled main, many places, including Europe, Asia, and Central America. My question to you is, have you been to the Philippines and can you tell us about that experience? Uh, sure, yes. Uh, I have been back to the Philippines when I first was answering your questions. I didn't write down the Philippines for some reason, <laughs> but I did. I, I went back. Uh, I graduated from college in 2009 and the first country that I went back to in the first country on my passport was the Philippines. Um, so the first place that I went to in 2010, I was, I was 19 <laughs> and I went straight there and, and I loved it. I actually went straight back to the orphanage and then I went back again in 2012. And every time I went, I did go to the orphanage and I, I went to the place that I was raised by uh, nuns, some mm -hmm. Catholic nuns and hang, hang out with everybody there. And I got to see and meet the original caseworker that actually matched me with my parents. So it's pretty special. I, I love going back, eating, and then of course, adventuring. So I, I did go back and scuba dive in Boracay and Palawan. Uh, and I got to go around to a lot of the different islands and to Bataan. So I've been to a lot of these different islands just running around it. Great, that's great. Um, so you are a volleyball enthusiast, and you created an all-women's volleyball group. Can you tell me why you created the group and what you do? Um, do you compete at an, a professional level? Is this, um, do you do tournaments and competitions, stuff like that? Sure, yeah, so I move a lot, and now, well, I was in Hawaii, so I was in Hawaii for like two and a half, three years. And when I first moved there, there was a lot of volleyball, but it was mainly co-ed, so men and women. And there wasn't a lot of just women's pickup or women's volleyball. So with one of the other females on the island, we got together and we just started playing just women. And then it started to grow and then word traveled. And then we are, ended up getting a lot of younger. Uh, so even some teenagers, 14 year olds coming through. So it was more competitive at first. And then we started adding a lot of younger high schoolers. So then it turned into almost every Sunday, it was a little bit of training camp. And then we had a mini tournament. So every Sunday was a tournament, but we would mix the, the young and the old together so that we were also coaching and being competitive at the same time. And then it just, it still go, it's still going on, which is great. Um, I'm in Florida now, but uh, they're still going and meeting every every Sunday, and because of COVID, we didn't do we didn't grow into any bigger tournaments, so we kept it more local. Um, but I do think it has a potential of getting bigger and bigger on the island, so it's it's gotten really popular. Tell us about your journey in public service, starting with your education, and then your work in the government, both in the local and federal level. 
so I started college, obviously I started college 18. And then basically it was the second week of college classes. There was an opening on the county board, the La Crosse Wisconsin County Board. And I had a professor at the time. It was actually a former La Crosse mayor. He was a political science class and professor, and he just mentioned, if anyone's interested, there's this student position. And at the, at the time, I thought it was a regular job, <laughs> but it ended up being actual county board, like politician, public service position, but it was representing the student district. So the, the boundaries of the jurisdiction was mainly the campus area and where a lot of the students live. And so I just went, I went for it. I went to an interview, not really knowing what I was getting myself into. And they ended up appointing me. I was in high school, I was pretty involved and I had a lot of attributes, but I was still, I was only 18 and they decided to choose me. And I, so I started college and polit, being a politician at 18 and then then I loved it so much that the next year there was another same position, same jurisdiction, but at the city level. So I ended up going for that as well. So I, I held city council and county board while still going to college full time. So I, I didn't lower my hours, I was still full time college. So then I held both of those for a few years. Um, then prior to my senior year, I ended up uh, one of my advisors told me about a position that I could possibly go for at Social Security, which is also in the La Crosse um, city. And I interviewed for that. Uh, my resume was, uh, I guess I had quite a bit already at, at that time. I think I was, I was 21. So then I was 21. And so that impressed them that I was already holding city council, county board, college, and then with my, I'm probably bouncing around my degrees, it was political science and public administration, dual degree. And then I did have a minor in Spanish. So then I was also bilingual. Um, I, I unfortunately lost my Filipino oh. <laughs> languages, so I can't really speak them. I know a little bit. So I'll say a little bit here and there, but actually fluent, it was just English and, and Spanish. So then they hired me because they also needed interpreter, translator, and just the overall background. So then I was on with the federal government at that time. And then that's just kind of where I've been since then. Um, and then I just graduated. And as soon as I graduated, the next day, I was full time working with the federal government. So that's where you are now you're working at the Social Security Administration. Yes, uh, my, my official title is Social Insurance Specialist bilingual and i've held a few different details where i was a technical expert but i yeah i basically take claims but then also do interpretation and translation as well so having worked many years um, in the government you have met some prominent politicians um, <laughs> oh yeah so can you can you tell us some of the prominent ones you've met Sure. A lot of it was actually when I was on the city council county board. I don't know. I must have gotten on some type of politicians list that every time someone came through town, I was notified and I ended up being part of the welcoming committee, which I'm not complaining about. I met a lot of um, now prominent politicians. Um, I mean, I worked a little bit for some of the campaigns, but I was able to meet I never actually met Hillary Clinton, but I did meet uh, Michelle Obama and Chelsea Clinton. And then I did meet Bill Clinton, former president Bill Clinton, when he was actually campaigning for Obama. It was prior to Hillary running. And then I was in the same room and probably within arm's reach of uh, former president Obama, but I never actually shook his hand or got close enough to talk to him. Um, but yeah, it's this, that was probably the highest I went to is the pres former president, uh, Bill Clinton, and then being able to talk to and um, have a conversation with Michelle. That was uh, pretty special. 
Now, you are an aspiring lawyer. And as a matter of fact, you are studying for the um, um, law school admission test, commonly known as LSAT. Yes. And um, I would say you're quite an accomplished young woman. But why do you want to study law now? And why do you want to specialize in immigration law? When I graduated in 2009, I had already wanted to go to law school. And I just ended up putting it on the side. One of the reasons I didn't get into one of the, I did apply for law school, but I didn't get into the one that I wanted. And that was just enough of a deterrent that I just, I gave up on the dream altogether and I shouldn't have. I, but at the same time, I was put into a better financial position. So I just was working. That was attractive to just um, have a steady income. And then now, 13 years later, I feel <laughs> pretty, I'm financially stable. So that's not as much of an issue anymore. And that has always been a, a nagging dream or dream that's always been on the backside, wanting to get back into law school or go to law school. So I've been studying for the last year. Uh, I did get my April LSAT score back, which was pretty good. I was really excited. Uh, it's, it's high enough to easily get me into the law schools that I want to get into. So I was really happy about that. <laughs> As for the immigration, uh, it's partially, it's, it's kind of the journey of my life, just being an immigrant myself, but then also being bilingual. I'm just where I can put my skills to work would be with immigration and where I have a little bit more of a passion of all of the different types of law that you can really specialize in. Uh, so I would be able to apply my law degree at where I am. So I could do legal work here at Social Security, It'd just be casework, administrative cases, federal law, that would, uh, that would apply and it would be useful. But for me, I'm thinking in the long run and when I want to, I actually want to early retire from Social Security and go into actual just law only and have my own practice and, and, and mainly specialize in immigration. And that's, that's where I, I think I wanted to be. It's just the long way around, but at the same time, it's not the, it's a good path to be on, so. You like to give back to and serve the community. Can you tell us some of the community services you've been involved in? Uh, sure, yes. So I, I've lived in a few different places. I was started, of course, in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and then I ended up moving to um, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And while I was there, I joined the Cultural Society of Filipino Americans, so CSFA. It was, so with, with my job, it's, it, it can be a lot of policy and it can be kind of bland, but part of me, I always need to have some creative outlook and cultural uh, influence in my life. So then I, just started looking up the Filipino societies there and then I ended up being a dancer with them and doing cultural dances with them um now I'm trying to remember it's like uh Malagueña and now I'm sorry now I can't remember all of it it's Cariñosa one Cariñosa of them. is one of them Cariñosa yep. and Malagueña mainly there which was a lot of fun I was I was working my way up to doing the more complex dances, but then I ended up moved, moving again. But then also just because of the position I was in, I ended up being kind of a liaison as well for Social Security and then the Filipino community too. So if they had Social Security questions, then I was also doing a little bit of business, but it was mainly for performance and just being in touch with the culture um, and eating a lot of Filipino food. <laughs> so. Uh, then after that, I, I moved to Madison, Wisconsin, and I, I loved the community and the family that I had built up there in Minneapolis, that I, I wanted another type of organization like that. And luckily for me, which honestly to me is still kind of surprising that the Midwest has such great groups, uh, the Pomana group helped me with uh, fulfilling my cultural needs, and that was the, the Filipino American Association of Madison and neighboring areas. And luckily, I got to meet a, a wonderful group of women, men and women there, and started doing some dances again. And then uh, it was it was more non-cultural dances, 
So then I decided, at least when I had joined up, so then I decided I wanted to do a cultural dance. And they're like, well, if you really want to do a cultural dance, you can teach us. <laughs> so it went from what I wanted to like, okay, well, if you really want something, sometimes you just got to, you have to do it yourself. So on YouTube, I go on and I'm like, okay, what should we do? And of course, of all the dances that we come up with, we, we go with the cancel dance, which is so difficult and dangerous. <laughs> and dangerous. And I'm not sure still when we did that performance if we were supposed to have live candles, but they let us and we never spilled anything. So we were no, nothing. No one was injured in the process. But um, so then we uh, I got to learn and choreograph Pandango Sailao, which I love doing because it was such a challenge. And so there are times I don't know how we're going to pull this off. But I think we had about eight eight women and they had the faith in me to, to teach them how to do this dance and it ended up being really beautiful um and then of then from there just just going from the dance and being involved culturally i wanted to be uh more of a professional pr position so then i joined the scholarship committee i was a co-chair and then i ended up making my way to being like a board member um representing on the scholarship committee and then it came to a point just because I was working at that level that they did ask me to be the president elect. So then at one point they, I was selected to try and be the next president for Pomana, but then I moved to Hawaii. <laughs> so then that, that changed and then I just keep moving, but, um, I was, I was going to do the same thing in, in Hawaii, but I ended up, honestly, the volleyball thing took over because I always play volleyball and that ended up being kind of my, I guess you'd say that would be the community service I did in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us um, the current projects you're working right now? Uh, the current projects, well, other than the LSAT, uh, now it's law school applications, so it's not as much of a project, but it is my main focus. I'm still working full time with Social Security down here. So that's the thing with the job. I've been able to work the entire time that I've been running around and, and moving. It's always been with, I've been able to keep my job. So very lucky and grateful for that. So working for that, uh, one of the details that did come up was uh, a border detail where I would be able to volunteer and help with the unaccompanied children at the border uh, the immigrants there either with immigration process but also with the asylum process and also matching those children since we had thousands of children separated from their parents and part of that too was that they needed people that could speak spanish um, that's been put on hold because my supervisor has actually I, it's it's kind of, it's a compliment, but I was disappointed. They said that they really needed me at the office here. So they, they aren't letting me do it quite yet, but they're, they haven't officially said no. They said that maybe in the future, but right now they need me to keep working here, but I'm hoping I can be involved in other ways uh, with the border and the situation there. Um, and then just because I moved here, I actually just started looking up Filipino gr groups. There's a Filipino group of Pensacola. So uh, I reached out to them and I'll wait, I'm waiting to hear um, what they do here. And hopefully I can volunteer and, and see what, what those guys are up to. So what or who is your inspiration in life? Uh, that's a good question. I have to think about that one. Uh, there's a lot of self-driven determination that I have. Uh, but a lot of it, I do believe, is the situation that I come from. Um, I think that being adopted has been my biggest, I'd say, motivating factor, not necessarily inspiration, but it's been a motivating factor because I know that my life would be a lot different if I wasn't adopted. Uh, and I'm grateful for the opportunities that I have. And part of it, too, is going back to the orphanage. It, I, I think that that helps motivate me like if I stay grounded I I've you know I've met former presidents and I've been able to travel the world and we talk about early retirement and I'm financially stable but at the same time um, I stay humble I have to stay humble because in the long run um, I, I would like to give back more to that orphanage specifically so I 
I don't know, is that it's not necessarily inspiration of that situation, but just motivation that there's always something in this world that we can be doing. Um, and as much as we, we all have, we're all grateful and we have a lot of privilege here and we could be putting that towards just, there's just so many things that the world needs right now. So, <laughs> and I just, be, being where I'm from, that's been the story that I know, you know, that, that not everybody has, has is born with privilege so i just i just remember that that there's always something that can be d done so do you have if any inspirational message to our viewers sure yes there's a, a quote that i always use when i was little or in middle school and then just kept using it through high school and college and uh, i keep looking at it every once in a while because it keeps me motivated um, by Helen Keller, I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. And it's just that, you know, you don't have to be a professional athlete or a millionaire. You can make a difference just with small gestures, uh, how we make others feel and what we can do, uh, even if it's small financial donations, just little things will add up and that'll make a big difference in this world. That's a great message. Thank you again, JC, for being here and congratulations and good luck on your future endeavors. Thank you, thank you. And I hope that I can meet you all in person. I have a lot of family up in, and friends still up in Wisconsin, so I'm planning to hopefully get up there soon and meet you all in person. Great, that would be great. And this is Margie Bruce here at Global Inspiration, where you need to be seen, you need to be heard, and be an inspiration to the world.